Welcome to Season 2 of the To Health With That podcast, where we break up big health topics into small bites. I'm Amy, and this season I'll share all the tips, tricks, and hacks you need to get healthy with an MTHFR mutation in a step-by-step, week-by-week process. I can't wait. This week, let's talk about vitamin D, MTHFR, and the VDR gene SNP. So like everything else we talk about, MTHFR and vitamin D have a curious relationship. Vitamin D doesn't link into the folate cycle or the methylation cycle or the BH4 pathway, so it isn't an obvious connection. But it is thought to be linked through the sharply named folate vitamin D UV hypothesis of skin pigmentation. So let's break that down, along with a couple of gene SNPs that affect vitamin D specifically. So vitamin D is all the rage right now. It's a fat-soluble vitamin that basically sounds like it's a miracle in all the research. It helps to prevent everything from depression to cancer. It helps you build strong bones by increasing absorption and retention of calcium and also phosphorus. It reduces cancer cell growth, helps control infections, and reduces inflammation. Research has also found a link between high vitamin D levels and protection from the most severe consequences of COVID-19. So research generally has been booming about vitamin D for the last 15 to 20 years, and startlingly, it has shown that roughly 24% of the U.S. population is vitamin D deficient, and almost 6% is severely so. Vitamin D deficiency has been implicated in autoimmune conditions like lupus and MS, diseases of aging like Alzheimer's and dementia, mental health issues like schizophrenia and depression, atopic conditions like asthma and eczema, bone diseases like osteoporosis and rickets, hormone issues like PMS and repeat pregnancy loss, inflammatory conditions like IBD and tooth and gum decay, and other conditions like cancer, ADHD, and erectile dysfunction. Vitamin D is found in a small number of foods, including egg yolks, oily fish, red meat, mushrooms, and liver. The bulk of the vitamin D in your body, however, is produced via a chemical reaction between sunlight and your skin. Specifically, it needs ultraviolet radiation on your skin. There are a couple of gene SNPs that affect vitamin D levels. They're called VDR, BSM, and VDR, TAC. So VDR gene SNPs code for vitamin D receptors, so it isn't actually the manufacturer of vitamin D per se. It's the ability to metabolize, transport, and use the vitamin D that's in question here. There are other gene SNPs that are emerging for vitamin D, but these are the most actually studied. So VDR-TAC is associated with both vitamin D levels in the blood and also with muscle growth and bone density on strength training. The CC variant, which is the wild type, is generally linked to high vitamin D levels as well as greater muscle growth and bone density with strength training exercises. The TT variant is associated with lower vitamin D status and less muscle growth. The CT form is somewhere in the middle. VDRBSM is associated with immunoprotection, bone mineral density, and also stature. So the wild type, or GG allele, has a lower risk of bone density issues, normal stature, and a more typical immunity. The AA allele has a higher risk of bone density problems, is likely to be more short in stature, and may have specific types of immune compromise. The AG allele is somewhere in the middle of those two states. And obviously, lots of things go into stature, not just this one gene. So in terms of having these gene SNPs, the relationship between the SNPs and pathology depends entirely on your vitamin D levels. So to me, the clear path to balancing out a VDR gene SNP lies in boosting vitamin D levels. This is where we leave solid research and enter my own musings and suppositions, so take this as a well-educated guess and nothing more. The typical quote-unquote normal range for vitamin D on blood tests is really broad, between 20 or 30 nanograms per milliliter and 100 nanograms per milliliter, just depending on the lab doing the testing. Although there is some debate about what constitutes an optimal number, for most people I think hovering somewhere around the 40 to 50 nanogram per milliliter mark seems logical. Not too close to the lower limit, but also not pushing crazy high numbers for no reason. For people with VDR polymorphisms, I encourage numbers closer to 70 to 80 nanograms per milliliter, 
simply because if your body has trouble transporting, metabolizing, or using vitamin D, then giving it a higher background level may help to compensate. Again, this is my own supposition and hasn't been particularly well-researched yet. So now, let's get into this complicated relationship between folate and vitamin D. This is actually interesting because it's a departure from the usual chemical pathways that we typically talk about. Folate is sensitive to ultraviolet radiation, so the more time you spend with your skin in direct sunlight, especially on high UV index days, the more folate your body uses and needs. This happens because UV light generates free radicals within your skin, and folate actually acts as an acceptor for those free radicals, essentially doing the duty of an antioxidant in this situation to help protect your vulnerable tissues from damage. Folate also works overtime donating methyl groups to DNA that gets damaged by UV radiation, essentially helping to protect your skin from the mutations that would lead to skin cancers. The bottom line here is that UV exposure uses up folate reserves, while UV exposure generates vitamin D. So there's a remarkable theory of human evolution, the aforenamed folate vitamin D UV hypothesis of skin pigmentation, snappy, that states that skin pigment evolved as humans migrated northward out of Africa in order to maximize and balance the levels of both of these nutrients, right? Folate on one hand and vitamin D on the other because they're both so pivotal for successful reproduction as well as overall health. The theory states that skin pigments were concentrated and skin remained dark in areas closer to the equator in order to buffer some of the effects of the tremendous amount of UV exposure, right? So they're maximizing folate status, but to still allow for enough vitamin D processing. Therefore, people with darker skin pigment actually need more sunlight exposure to manufacture enough vitamin D, and their folate is well protected by those pigments. People who migrated northward were becoming vitamin D deficient due to lack of adequate UV exposure, and so evolution favored lighter skin pigments that need less UV to make adequate vitamin D, but that also leaves folate more vulnerable to UV-related breakdown. Because of this contrary relationship between folate and vitamin D with UV exposure, it's becoming kind of a research target. An interesting study published in the journal Neurology found that in children with ADHD, which has known linkages with both MTHFR and low vitamin D status, the effects of MTHFR on vitamin D weren't entirely what the researchers predicted. So children with the C677T homozygous polymorphism, so TT or two mutant copies, actually had higher vitamin D levels than individuals with the CC or the wild type allele. Individuals with a heterozygous mutation or CT allele were somewhere in the middle. The researchers theorized that because people with MTHFR need to conserve folate and therefore need to avoid prolonged UV radiation exposure, that we have developed some mechanism to manufacture or maintain vitamin D levels more efficiently. Yet another MTHFR superpower. So I'll directly quote from the article, which says, As such, individuals with MTHFR TT may manufacture and or maintain vitamin D more efficiently due to their genetic need to avoid prolonged UVR exposure. Hence, vitamin D levels may be higher at baseline in children with MTHFR TT status. Remarkable. So, yet another MTHFR superpower. So glad we've got that on our side. Thank you guys so much for listening today. I am really excited that there are actually courses live at courses.tohealthwiththat.com. It's very exciting. Also, even if you don't really want to take the MTHFR basics course, if that's just too low level for you... There is going to be a beta testing group of the MTHFR for Life course that's much more in-depth. And that one, for the beta testers, will be one quarter of the price, so 75% off. So definitely, definitely sign up on the email list if you're interested, because that is how you'll know when it's open. 